Good morning and welcome to First Church. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Well, um, we are glad that you are here and ready to worship God and give him praise. If you would check out your connection card, please, and fill that out so we might know um, how you would like to volunteer and how that your attendance is here. That would be a wonderful gift for us. Um, it also allows us to see your prayer requests, and we do check on those. So um, if you would let us know. Also, there's a reminder about the Sisterhood Banquet um, is set for 6 p.m. this Thursday night in the social room. So um, you all have your tickets. Are you still selling tickets? Okay. You could... <laughs> Patty still has tickets. If you still want to buy a ticket, you can still get one. The annual planting of the Garden Day will be the 19th, which is this Friday at 9 a.m., and you can volunteer to plant geraniums around the outside of the church and send, sign your connection card if you would like to be able to do that with us, please. The day of Pentecost will be May the 28th. Um, please wear red on that day. So we are going to celebrate Jeff's re retirement and Pentecost, and we're just going to celebrate all day. So come dressed in your red. Also, Jeff is retiring from his position on May the 28th, and there is one service that will be at 9.30, and there will be a reception down in um, the social room. I always have to remember, it's called the social room. The social room, thank you. <laughs> the social room, right after, the, right after worship service, um, again, I think there's a spot on the connection card if you are planning to come, just so we can plan numbers uh, for food a little bit. Please sign up on the connection card. And the one service, and this will continue from the 28th through Labor Day on September the 3rd. So um, Sunday school classes for the children will be during the same time as our worship, except for the first Sunday of the month, and we'll continue to have everybody come in together for, for that. And also, in I had picked up the connection card. It's the Make It Happen card. So in the bulletin, you will also find a Make It Happen card. There are some things that are going on that we need volunteers or it can't happen. Um, we need communion servers. We will have communion, um, but we do need volunteers. Um, the nursery volunteer, we've had a request for the nursery to be filled, and so we need volunteers, and we need to have two to staff it, and we'll go ahead and we have the online training for Safe Sanctuary, as well as a background check that you can do. So we need to get you done that direction, but if you could volunteer to help with that, please sign up. If we don't have volunteers, we can't offer it. So that's kind of where we are with that piece. And the other thing is the July 4th parade. Now, my understanding is you've always done it. Um, so, but we need people to help always do it. And um, we're, we've got to get it done and going. Um, and I know everybody likes to go to the Granville Parade. It's for the Granville Parade. You love to go and you love to wave back to us, but we need somebody in the parade and to decorate for the parade so that you can wave at us. So we'll need volunteers. Let us, um, now this morning, we, it is because of Mother's Day, it is a special occasion that the children are going to sing to us.
Okay. So we have started separating into two groups now. We have our, our younger group here, these three, and then we have our older group over here. And so this group will be with piano, this group's without. They're gonna do their best to project for you and get that sound out there, but they are just beginning to learn some very simple songs. So these two songs that they're gonna sing today are two Bible school songs that I kind of remember as a kid. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Sunshine Mountain. Climb up Sunshine Mountain. So they're going to do their best for you here. They're, they're excited. And then we'll bring this group up, and they'll definitely, they, they are like pros now. So we're good. these three head off this way. Very nice. Well done. All right, and now our upper elementary group, come on up. All right, our elementary group here is going to sing two songs. The first one is called Sing with the Spirit, and it's a combination of I'm going to sing when the Spirit says sing, and I'm going to sing, sing, sing. And then their second selection is one called Hush, Somebody's Calling My Name. And it's a combination of Hush, Somebody's Calling My Name, and New Name in Glory. So we've got two pieces, two very different styles, and they are excited to go today.
So that concludes our pro part of the program here, but I just want to let you know we'll be back probably in the fall because over the summer, all the stuff going on. So we, it doesn't mean we won't be singing or playing bells up there, but this was kind of their final hurrah for the spring before school's out, and I'm very, very proud of them. They have come. They just keep getting better and better all of the time. So thank you. Thank you, boys and girls, for joining us and being a part and sharing your faith with us. <laughs> Enthusiasm. I like that. Let us stand and sing together. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. That's one of my favorites. Beautiful. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love for us and your care for us. We thank you for the gift of grace that you offer so freely to us. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together and praise you. Lord, we are so blessed. And we come today thanking you and praising you for all that you have given us, but we lift up today um, the mothers and those that have been mothering to us. We remember the women in our lives who have birthed us, adopted us, fostered us, nurtured us, cared for us, shaped us, and disciplined us, who are no longer beside us. We honor the women in our lives who bring forth new beginnings, embrace us as their own, foster our growth, nurture us, care for us, and help us form into better people by the power of their love, which comes from you, O oh Lord. We pray for the mothers who have buried children. We pray for the women who long to be mothers, but are not. We also pray for each mother-child relationship that has been strained or broken by action or inaction, distance or illness. And Lord, we come lifting up and encouraging many mothers who are overwhelmed, trying to make ends meet, who while exhausted, love anyway. We encourage parents who must raise their children alone and grandparents and other guardians who nurture children in their parents' stead. God, we thank you. Help us to recognize your light and life in all of our ways. And help us to shine your light into this world. For those who find love a stranger will find us generous friends. And we thank you that you have brought us together in prayer and that we might pray together the prayer you taught your disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Today's scripture comes from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 22. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and somebody else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Say, Glade was on the ball this morning because I threw a curveball and changed the scripture and came in and said, Here's the new page. And he said, I got it. I only added a few verses, but you never know what we're going to do. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our scripture for this morning, if you hadn't looked in the bulletin, picks up right after where we left off last week. The disciples had gone fishing, and they caught nothing, and then they saw Jesus, and they caught a whole lot, and then they had breakfast with Jesus on the beach. That part of this final section of John's gospel helps us to remember th that we as followers of Jesus have been given that task to go and fish for people. We heard about that last week. The story continues with Jesus speaking to Peter directly and questioning him and giving him some final instructions, we might say. It's, it's a moment in this gospel where, um, because of all sorts of things about the nature of it, it's been discussed and debated and argued about endlessly for, since the gospel of John was written, with folks trying to get perfect insight into the motivations of Jesus in asking these questions to Peter. And so much has been made of this exchange between Peter and Jesus that sometimes it can be hard for us to look at, at this passage and not automatically assume we know exactly what's happening. We might know exactly what's happening, but it's hard to set aside that that preconception of we know exactly what's going on. To be fair, we probably do know exactly what's going on. We've talked about it enough that we probably know exactly what's happening. The commonly accepted understandings of this scene, probably what you've heard some preacher preach about a whole bunch over the course of your life, if you've been in the church, you've probably heard them talk about it. Sometimes, though, knowing a story too well 
can keep us from seeing the message it really wants to convey. And I, I think that's the case here in John 21. At least it's what I had to do when I sat down to, to work on my sermon, to do my, my study and to read the scripture and to figure out what I was going to say today. I had to stop and say, okay, look at it again. You know what it says, but look at it again. So Jesus asks Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter answers three times, yes. Now it is a little bit more complicated than that. One of the things that, you know, preachers and Bible scholars will talk about is the fact that Jesus and Peter are using different words for love in the Greek. Jesus is using at least the first two times a form of, of the Greek word agape. And Peter responds with a form of phileo, different types of love. Why? The third time Jesus switches and uses Peter's word. A second thing that, that we often talk about is that Jesus probably asked Peter this same question three times in order to redeem Peter from his three denials and then to recommission him and send him out again with this new understanding of his job as a disciple. It's also very interesting that a charcoal fire is mentioned only twice in John's Gospel, one is here on the beach, and the other is in the courtyard of Caiaphas's home. We'll come back to all of that. See, when, when we read parts of the Bible that, that are familiar to us, things that we've encountered countless times, or the stories that we know without having to read it on the page, Often we focus on what we know and we miss out on the opportunity to let those stories remain alive. We might know exactly what God is saying to us because we've heard it and we have taken that story into us and made it our own. But the chance always remains that God might speak to us anew. We know what we know and we're comfortable with it and, and it offers us that familiarity and comfort. And that's good. We need those things to cling to as, as humans. We need familiarity. We need comfort. We need a rock to which we can cling in the storm. Sometimes, though, God likes to shake things up. I'll give you a sneak peek. I'm not going to say anything new about this passage. So God didn't shake it up this week. But sometimes it happens. So we have to remind ourselves to slow down when we come to the scripture and say, look at this again, like we're reading it for the first time. So I thought, let's just go through it again and read it like we're reading it for the first time. Not looking for anything specific, just looking at what God has to say. So after the part about fish that Pastor Barb talked about last week, you see Jesus and the disciples are on the beach and they have breakfast. And they're sitting around this charcoal fire. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, Simon, son of John. Not calling him Peter, but calling him by his given name. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Okay, what are these? There's all sorts of interesting analyses of that. Some people think it means, do you, more, do you love me more than these, these other disciples, more than you love them? Or is it, do you love me more than they love me? Or my favorite, because they had just been fishing. Do you love me more than you love these things, your boat and your nets and the fish? The specifics don't really matter, I think. It's the question. 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus responds, feed my lambs. The point here is that when Jesus asks Peter if he loved him more than anything else, if Jesus was first in his life, when we know that just a few days ago Jesus was not first in his life, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And so again, Jesus asks Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. There's no more than these on this question, but Peter gives the same answer. And so Jesus says, take care of my sheep. Jesus actually said, shepherd my sheep, which has a whole sorts of connotations. Take care, tend. That gets the point across a little easier for us to understand. Jesus wants Peter to care for the people, Jesus' people, just like Jesus had cared for them. And so then we come to the third question. Jesus asks again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And John writes that Peter was hurt by this. He wasn't offended. It's a hurt that comes from a realization that you had been wrong, that the answers you had given might not have been wholly true, that the question came repeatedly because you needed to recognize your answer. Peter was hurt because he finally realized why Jesus was asking the question. Three times he had denied him, and so three times Jesus asks to make sure of how Peter feels. So Peter responds differently to this question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus says, feed my sheep. The story continues on with Jesus telling Peter about how he would die. And, and Peter, being Peter, sidesteps. He doesn't like that. And so he points to the beloved disciple and says, hey, Jesus, what about that guy? Don't talk about me. Let's talk about him. So Jesus talks about him, and, and it doesn't really matter the words Jesus says. It's how he closes his explanation about the beloved disciple. He says to Peter, I'll do with him what I will. What you need to do is follow me. There's a story that, that I heard years ago that came to my mind as I was going over this scripture. I don't know if it directly connects, but it did for me. Full disclosure, right? The story might not make sense to you, but it, made, it came to my mind and it made sense to me. It's a story that you know, I, I probably heard in youth group many years ago, and it it's talking about a, a moment that occurred between some people during World War II. Who knows if it is true or not? Doesn't matter. It was um, a cold, damp London morning, which is every London morning. And there was an American soldier driving Jeep through town, returning to base from some duty. He's driving through it's part of town, and he sees a young boy standing on the street, peering into the window at a bakery. It's his face up against the glass, fogging it up with his breath. So the, the soldier pulled over to see what was going on, and, and 
looks in the window and sees the baker kneading his dough, preparing the pastries for the day, and sees a giant platter of donuts there, freshly prepared. The soldier knew by the boy's appearance that there was no way he could afford this luxury, not during that time. So he goes inside and buys a bag of donuts. Came out and of this, of the bakery with a bag full of freshly made donuts. I love donuts, so you can just imagine the aroma of them when they are fresh. And he walks over to the boy and hands him the bag and says, here, I thought you might like some of these. The boy is just awestruck at this generosity. And he looks up at the soldier with his eyes wide and he says, Mister, are you God? And the soldier laughed and said, No, no, son, I'm not God. And he got in his Jeep and drove away. So I think that sort of interaction, that story, represents exactly what the scripture is about for us. See, Jesus appears on the lake shore of our life, calls us back from whatever we've been doing, shares a meal with us. I'd prefer a bag of donuts than a bunch of fish. But shares that moment talks to us, keeping us wondering what exactly is going on, and then goes to leave us to work in his name, to care for his people, to feed his people, to shepherd his people. See, we could focus on all of those things that that you know, Bible scholars and theologians debate about the fish and, and the question three times and the charcoal fire and the difference between the words for love that Jesus and Peter use. We could nitpick about those things. We could focus on, on that idea that, that Jesus is giving Peter absolution for his sin of denial. But I think there's a more important part to the story. There's something more right before us. And I think it's that Jesus uses this opportunity with Peter, talking to Peter right in front of all the others that are gathered there, not hiding from them that Jesus knew what Peter had done, not hiding from them that he was giving Peter a chance to seek forgiveness, to be given a new life again. And so Jesus turns to Peter and he asks him these questions and isn't just talking to Peter. He's talking to all of the disciples, reminding them of their task as his followers. What all of us as Christians are called to do, to care for one another. See, Jesus uses this meal on the beach to ask them to recall the last time they ate together. That time when he says, you're no longer servants. You're my friends. And then he commands them, feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. He tells them that this is the next step in your journey 
as my followers. See, Jesus would soon leave them and ascend into heaven, and his work would become their own. Everything they had seen and done with Jesus over the past three years would now be their work to do. With that help of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus reminded them. So Jesus used this moment, this meal, to offer an invitation. He invited them to move beyond what they had done with him and to go into a new life, to be his presence so that others would know what Jesus had done. See, Jesus used every chance he had, especially this last moment that we see in John's gospel, to teach them the one lesson he, only, he ever taught. Jesus only ever taught one lesson, just different iterations of it. Love God and love others. We talk about that as the, the golden rule or, or, or the greatest commandment. If you look through everything that Jesus says in John's gospel, this is the only lesson he taught. He just used different words. And so on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus once again gives them this lesson in asking if they love him and telling them to care for his people. He's reminding them Friends, all you have to do is love God and love one another. So that's what John's gospel is all about. If we love Jesus more than anything else, even fishing, then we'll listen to his command to follow him, to go out into the world and to love his people. It's a type of love that requires us to be part of the world. We can't hide away expecting that it just will all get better on its own. We have to be in the world, showing the love of Jesus. We have to be like Peter. We have to listen to the voice of God calling us, ready to jump out of the boat because we're so excited. And then we have to go and love as though we're all part of the same family. Because after all, isn't that exactly how God has loved us? Made us part of his family? Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask that you would help us to Pay attention to your sheep, to do our best to care for your people in whatever ways we can, and to know that we are not called to take care of all of the problems on our own, just to do our best. And so, Lord, help us to look on the life that you led, the lessons that you taught, the love that you shared, so that we might be equipped and energized to go and do likewise as we follow you out into the world to share our love for you and our love for your people. Amen.
Friends, go this week knowing that Jesus has loved you and will always love you. And go sharing that good news, that joy that there is someone who will love us no matter what. Amen.